growth and development in living organisms. Growth and development are one of the characteristics of all living things. But is growth the same as development? We'll start by distinguishing between these two terms. What is growth? Growth is a quantitative permanent increase in the size of an organism that is quantitative. There's a change in the quantity and this change is permanent. Growth is an irreversible increase in the dry mass of an organism. For example, this plant is undergoing growth. From the seed, it, there's an increase in height, there's an increase in mass and volume of the organism. In same case, this chicken, as an animal, is undergoing change, an irreversible change in its mass. That is growth. Development, on the other hand, is a qualitative aspect of growth. As there is change in mass or height, there are also certain changes in complexity as organism grows. These changes are what we refer to as development. Like here, a plant is developing to form flowers. There may not be an increase in mass aside between, say, this and that stage, but the formation of new structures, the increase in complexity of the organism, that constitutes development. In an animal such as a butterfly, also change from the egg, larva, pupa, and to the adult. You can see the formation of new structures leading to increase in complexity. That constitutes development. Even in human beings, like in the males, for example, development of facial hairs is an example of development. So in general, development of the secondary sexual characteristics in humans are examples of development. Now, growth, we will we'll focus more on the growth aspect. In multicellular organism, growth occurs in three phases. The first is cell division. This is the increase in the number of cells through mitosis. So the increase in number is brought about by repeated mitotic cell division. Then there is cell expansion or elongation. This is the increase in the size of the cell due to absorption and assimilation of materials. Now cell elongation is more pronounced in plant cells than in animal cells. This is because in the plant cells, there is formation of the subvacuoles that greatly increase the size of the individual cells. Then the third phase is cell differentiation. This is the structural modification leading to formation of tissues and organs. So the cells become modified so that they can perform specific functions. That is what cell differentiation is. So growth and change occur at the cellular level in terms of numbers, which then lead to growth and change in the tissue levels, organ levels, and hence growth and change in the overall form, shape, and structure of a multicellular organism. This is illustrated in growth and development stages in humans. In the human, the zygote divides repeatedly 
from one cell, two cell, four cell, eight cell stage, 16, until it forms a mass of cells known as the blastocyst, which then develops further to form the embryo. When the cells in the blastocyst are rearranged to form the embryo, the embryo then continues to grow until it becomes distinctly human. At that stage, then referred to as the fetus. So these are changes that are taking place at the cellular level, tissue and organ level, and then the overall form, shape and structure. So when the embryo acquires the form, shape and structure of, of a human being, then it is said to be a fetus. Now, in plants, growth occurs in specific areas. So growth is localized. But in animals, growth is generalized. That is, it occurs all over the body. Now, how do we measure growth? How do we show that growth has taken place? There are different ways, especially in plants, that we can show that growth has taken place. So growth can be measured at various levels of the organism. It can involve the growth of cells, tissues, organs, or the entire organism. So for both plants and animals, growth can be estimated by measuring parameters such as height, leaf surface area, weight of the plant, volume, or any other aspect at regular intervals. Weight is normally very convenient. Weight is more convenient and reliable parameter of measuring growth. There are two aspects of weight that are normally used. Fresh weight and dry weight. Fresh weight of an organism refers to the total weight and it is measured by simply placing the organism or part of an organism on a balance and the weight is measured. The advantages of using the fresh weight is that it is easy to measure. The organism is not interfered with and its growth can be measured repeatedly over a period of time. However, the disadvantage is that fresh weight is inaccurate because it is influenced by water content in the body, hence may not give the true biomass. On the other hand, dry weight gives us a more accurate picture of the biomass present. The dry weight refers to the amount of organic matter in an organism minus the water. There are different ways that you can use to obtain the dry weight. We can dry the plants out using herbarium. Herbarium refers to two flat boards. So the plant is placed between newspapers and then pressed, pressed between the two soft boards for a number of days until most of the water is driven out. Or you can sun dry the plant organism in a solar dehydrator, or you can oven dry the plant for a number of minutes. For example, if you use the oven drying, the organism, that is the plants, are killed, then placed in an oven at 110 
degrees centigrade. This evaporates the water in the cells but does not burn the carbohydrates, lipids and proteins. The specimen is then cooled in a desiccator and weighed. This is repeated until a constant mass is obtained. So oven drying is more convenient because it's faster. The advantage of using dry weight is that it is accurate. It gives the true biomass since the water is removed. However, the disadvantage is that the organism is killed and therefore we cannot follow the growth of an individual organism over a period of time. It is expensive because a large number of organisms is required from which a sample is taken at regular intervals to determine the dry weight. It is also expensive because especially where we use the oven, oven is an expensive instrument that is not cheaply acquired. This method is also time consuming because the drying process and then the repeated weighing until you get a constant dry mass for each sample takes a lot of time. However, when weight has been taken or any other parameter is measured and plotted against time, then a growth curve is obtained. For many organisms, this growth curve has a sigmoid or S-shaped this the growth curve is sigmoid or s shaped in form and this sigmoid curve has four distinct phases as shown in this illustration there is the lag phase exponential phase the decelerating phase and the plateau phase there is a lag phase, exponential, decelerating phase, and the plateau phase. Now, this growth pattern, the sigmoid with that sigmoid curve, shows that the growth tends to be slow at first and then speeds up and finally slows down as the adult size is attained. There are different events responsible for each of the phases. Starting with the lag phase. The lag phase is characterized by slow growth. And this is due to a number of reasons, two reasons mainly. One, the number of cells that are dividing in the organisms are still few. And two, the cells have not yet adjusted to the environmental factors. So in a new organism, the number of dividing cells are few and also these cells are yet to adjust to the environmental factors. So the rate of mitotic cell division is low, leading to the slow rate of growth. Then the exponential phase. This is characterized by very rapid growth. And the rapid growth is due to a number of reasons. One, there is a large number of dividing cells. Two, the cells in the multicellular organisms have adjusted to the environment. Three, nutrients and other factors such as oxygen are optimum. So the cells are dividing and growing at a very fast rate. And four, the rate of cell increase due to division is greater than the rate of cell death. Remember, in a multicellular organism, Cells are always dividing and cells are always dying. So during the exponential phase, the rate at which new cells are being produced is higher than the rate at which cells are dying. In the decelerating phase, this phase is characterized by slowing down in growth. This slowing down in growth is due to a number of reasons. One, most cells are fully differentiated and mature. Two, there are fewer cells dividing. 
in proportion to the rest of the body. Three, limited nutrients. There's limited nutrients. So the rate at which the cells are growing is low. And four, accumulation of toxic wastes which inhibit growth in the body. Because the more the cells, the more the waste materials which must be removed. Now, if the large number of cells means that there is a faster rate of accumulation of toxic wastes, these act to inhibit growth. And then in the plateau or stationary phase, this phase is marked by the period when overall growth has ceased. There is zero growth. There is no increase or decrease. And the reason for this is that the cells, the rate at which the cells are, are dying, is equal to the rate at which the cells are being produced. Now, in many organisms, after the plateau phase, the growth may actually now become negative. That is when the rate of cell death is greater than the rate of cell division. But during the plateau, there is a balance. The rate at which cells are being produced is equal to the rate at which the cells are dying. But this phase does not last for long. In many organisms, shortly, the growth will become negative because the rate at which the cells are dying is higher than the rate at which the cells, that is new cells, are being produced.